Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Sarah Roberts from Swansea University. Um, I'm here with my colleagues, Paul and uh, Simon from Physics. Um, and they are going to be helping me today on our journey through the universe. So just a little bit of sort of technical information about the session. So I'll be talking um, in a bit with a PowerPoint and fingers crossed we'll be using the telescope in Hawaii soon. Um, but just the chat function has been disabled on Zoom. So if you've got any questions or comments, then please use the Q&A um, thing at the bottom of the, the Zoom screen. You can post anonymously, so um, feel free to do that. What we'll... Um, try to do is if I don't if you've got questions for me as we go along I cannot concentrate on reading and talking at the same time I just I just can't do that um, so Simon um, will be trying to answer some of your questions if there's time at the end obviously I'll go through any of the other questions and answer them um, but if we do run out of time then we'll have a copy of the questions anyway and what I'll do is I'll answer them separately um, or put them in a, a PDF or Word document and I'll get them sent out to you. So your question will be answered, um, hopefully today, but maybe um, in, a, in a couple of days time. Um, I think that was everything that I was going to say. Um, I'm sure I'll get reminded if there's something else that I meant to say. So, we'll make a start. I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay, so I'm hoping that you can see my PowerPoint. I can see Simon, so can you nod if you can see my PowerPoint? Yeah, yeah brilliant, yeah, thank you. Okay, right. So today, this afternoon, we're going to go through a journey through the universe. Um, as I said, I'm Dr. Sarah Roberts. I'm an astronomer at Swansea University, um, but I'm also the Director of Education for the Forks Telescope Project. So some of you may have heard of the project before, some of you might not have done and it's new to you. Um, by the end of this um, webinar, you will know maybe not everything you need to know about the Forks Project, but, but most of what you need to know definitely what you need to know to actually access the project and do some astronomy yourselves, either from the comfort of your houses or from the classroom. So what I'm going to go through today is I'm going to give you a brief background to robotic or remote control telescopes, because um, that's what we're going to be using hopefully this afternoon. I'll give you some background to the telescopes and some of it will be more technical information um, than other parts, but this is so that you can fully understand when we actually then take control of the telescope, you can see what we're doing. So at quarter past three, we will be, uh, or just before then, I'll switch over to the controls of a five million pound telescope in Hawaii and fingers crossed, the weather will be good there. I had a practice session on Wednesday and it was raining in Hawaii, so we couldn't use the telescope then. Um, but when I did this a couple of weeks ago, the weather was perfect. So I haven't checked the weather because I wanted to be as surprised as um, you will be um, to see whether it's uh, good weather or bad weather at the telescopes. Um, if we are weathered out um, and we can't control the telescopes, in real time of the internet, then I do have a backup. We will use the telescope interface, but we'll actually put the observations, we'll queue them up instead. And I'll explain how to do that afterwards. Um, and then I thought I'd finish off um, with showing you some examples of what you actually can do with the telescopes. So whether you're a teacher, whether you're a student, whether you're an amateur astronomer, and um, the sorts of things that you can do using the telescopes yourselves. But, it's not just going to be me talking through this. First of all, we're going to ask you some questions. So I'm going to see how well you listen to what I say. Now, we've got um, a poll here, um, which is going to be launched um, in a minute. It's nine questions. The questions towards the end are more um, for us to see what sort of, um, sort of demographic, what sort of backgrounds um, you might come from. The first few questions are to basically test your knowledge of astronomy, just to see um, 
how much you know. Um, and then we'll, we'll run the same poll at the end as well to see whether you've learned anything from the talk, which I hope you have. So if, if we can launch the, um, do I have to stop sharing to launch the poll? I don't think so. Because it doesn't show up on my screen otherwise. And I can't see the, oh, there we are. Okay, so the poll should have launched now. So you'll, you'll see a number of questions on there. I will be quiet in a minute so you can concentrate on the questions. But if you just um, click in the poll um, and answer the questions, and I'll give you a few minutes to do this, um, and then we'll end the poll and we'll start the, the webinar. I should also say that the poll is anonymous as well. So don't worry if you don't know the answers. I'm not going to be writing, writing to your teachers or anything. <laughs> There's a couple of people who can't see the poll. Uh, indications are yeah. many of you can see the poll, so a few of you are having some problems. It should it should show up, I think, as a pop up window. Our, our expert has suggested it might be that you've just joined and um, after, we, after we launch the poll, there will be a, another poll at the end and you'll be, you'll be able to do that one. <laughs> I don't know what, that, what that's going to do to the results, but never mind. So nearly 90% of you have voted so far. So we'll just wait a little bit.
yeah, I think I think we should probably move on now. Yeah. What do you think, Sarah? Okay, thanks everyone. So yeah, if we can close the poll. Ooh, I can see some results already. Great. So I've asked you some questions. Now I'll carry on. So just a brief introduction to robotic telescopes or remote control telescopes. These are essentially telescopes that you would use to obtain images from distant sites. So normally um, astronomers, if they wanted to use a telescope and take images of objects in the night sky, they would unfortunately have to travel to exotic places to actually use these telescopes. So I know when I was doing my PhD, it was, it was a hardship. I had to travel to the Canary Islands and to Puerto Rico and to Australia just to access telescopes. Um, but nowadays with the advent of technology um, and actually with a pandemic as well, it's actually great that you can control and access telescopes from wherever you are in the world and you can control them over the internet and get the images and the data that you want. Now, with robotic telescopes, you can, there are two modes of observing. There's what we call live or real-time observing. So that's when you are physically controlling the telescope there and then, and nobody else in the world can control it at that time. That's what we'll be doing um, this afternoon. Or there's the um, queued um, version or offline, where you have your list of objects that you want to observe, and what you do is you put it into an interface, you click go, and then the telescopes are clever enough to schedule um, when, when, the, um, when the observation should take place. Now, the image that we've got here can show you the picture of um, where the three biggest professional telescopes are that are available for educational use. So they are, um, there's one in Hawaii over here, I won't test your geography, um, this is the Liverpool telescope, not in Liverpool because it's so rainy there, it's in the, um, the Canary Islands and over in um, Australia, down here. So you can see that the telescope in Australia and the telescope in Hawaii, these can be operated in real time mode, they can also be operated in offline mode and the telescope in the Canary Islands um, can only be op operated on offline mode. So with the Fawkes Telescope project, we have access to Fawkes Telescope North in Hawaii and Fawkes Telescope South in Australia. Um, and then this telescope in La Palma is actually run by Liverpool John Moores University and it's part of the National Schools Observatory. Um, so it's mainly used by professional astronomers, but there is some fraction of time available for schools. Um, but if you want to do real time observing, then it's the Fawkes um, telescopes that you can that you can use. So all three of these telescopes are two meter telescopes, by which I mean the main mirror, the primary mirror of the telescope is two meters across. My uh, zoom webcam doesn't allow me to show you two meters if I spread my arms out, um, but that's the, the diameter of the main mirror. So when we talk about the size of a telescope, we, we're talking about the size of the, the main mirror. A brief history to the Fawkes Telescope and the Fawkes Telescope project. The project began in the year 2000, so it's 20 years old now, and it was funded by Dill Fawkes, who gave £10 million of his own money. This is the effect that it had on him. Um, he needed a drink after that. The Astronomy Research Council also gave a million pound at the time, and the UK government gave just over um, half a million pound. And they gave... Um, all this money to this project because Dill Fawkes did his degree and his PhD in the UK, he got a PhD um, in UCL I think it was, he went over to America, made loads of money in computing and then came back to live in the UK and what he noticed was that students in schools didn't seem to be particularly interested in the STEM subjects, so science, technology, engineering and maths. And he wanted to do something to help enthuse pupils in schools in these areas. So he thought, I know, I'll give £10 million, we'll build a, a two-metre telescope in Hawaii, another one in Australia, 
they'll be free for schools to use and we can actually use astronomy as the hook um, to get pupils interested in science again. Five years later, I think Dale realized how expensive it was to run these telescopes and he essentially sold the telescopes and the Folks Telescope project um, to a company called LCO. So that stands for Las Cumbres Observatory, who are based in California. So Wayne Rosen um, is the owner of Las Cumbres Observatory. He was the senior vice president for engineering in a small website you might have heard of called Google. Um, and when he left Google, when he retired, they gave him something like um, a thousand Google shares and they were worth hundreds of thousands of dollars um, when he left. So he had a lot of money and it was his retirement dream to build a network of telescopes across the world. So this is a hundred hundred million dollar program um, that LCO are running now. So they own the, the Fawkes telescopes, um, but they also have built their own telescope network. So the Fawkes telescope project um, is the education program that we run in the UK, mainly the UK and Europe. Um, and LCO also do have their own um, education project as well. So if you are a teacher or a student listening to this, um, then you can look either on the Folks Telescope Project website or the LCO website and find lots of educational resources. And it's all free, even all the training and everything that we do is all for free. So this is an image of the Global Telescope Network as it stands at the moment. So we've got a key down the bottom here in this box, two meter telescopes, one meter telescopes, 0.4 meter telescopes. So here we've got Hawaii. So this is the two meter telescope that we'll be using today, weather permitting. We've got the two meter Fox telescope south in Australia over here, but you can also see the other sizes of telescopes that are at each site. So what you should notice about this um, image is that there's a ring of telescopes in the northern hemisphere and a ring of telescopes in the southern hemisphere and they're quite sort of equally spaced across the globe so the idea is wherever you are in the world there should be at least a set of telescopes in the darkness for you to be able to observe what's also brilliant is that we could use or you could use a telescope in australia or south africa or chile and actually see the southern sky. So depending on where you live, if you live in Wales, you might not be used to going outside and looking at the stars, but you should be a bit more familiar with the, the northern sky. If you're from the northern hemisphere, in this case, you can have a look at the southern hemisphere sky and vice versa. So if you're in the southern hemisphere, you can use a telescope in the northern hemisphere and have a look at the sky up there. This is um, a plot um, or a, a graph to show you, um, an image to show you why the telescopes, uh, Folks Telescope North and Folks Telescope South were originally placed in Hawaii and Australia. And the whole point of the Folks Telescope project was to enthuse UK students and UK pupils um, in science and maths. So the idea was when it is daytime, in the UK. So this bit here, the brighter bit, is showing you daytime. The darker bit is showing you nighttime. Um, so when it's daytime here in the UK, it's nighttime in Hawaii and Australia. So that's why they were located in those places. I got this plot from timeanddates.com. So it's showing us exactly where the sun and the moon are at half past two this afternoon. So we've gone back back. A bit now. So the moon's actually up in the sky, which I thought was quite interesting, um, but luckily not over anywhere near Hawaii. We don't want the bright moon in our images. So this is the, the telescope um, that we're planning on using today. It's not your, this is a telescope dome and it's not your traditional telescope dome that you might imagine um, with the sort of um, the domed roof. It's, it's what's called the clamshell design. So the idea of this, and I hope this works. So this is uh, obviously an artist's impression. The clamshell opens up completely. So the telescope is completely exposed to the air, which is beneficial because it means you don't get like warm air currents um, moving about in the telescope dome. 
um, and the telescope can move all the way around 360 degrees and it doesn't have to wait for the for the opening on the telescope roof itself to open it's just completely um, open to the to the elements there um, we have had some issues um, on the Hawaiian telescope because it's not always sunny in Hawaii or dry um, where the, the clamshell has been frozen. So the telescope would work, but the clamshell itself has been frozen over. So uh, there, are, there are good points and bad points to this design, um, but just to show you what we're going to be using. A little bit more um, information. So this is, this is a photograph of the Fawkes telescope before it was um, shipped out to Hawaii. Um, they were built in Birkenhead um, by a company called TTL. And I wanted to show you this picture because I just wanted you to see how big the telescope is compared to um, you know, the size of a human being. These are massive structures I and mean, imagine we'll be controlling this. So I'm sat in Cardiff, I'll be controlling this and it's all the way over in Hawaii and it's quite a feat of, te feat of um, technology. The design of the telescope, so the light comes into the telescope on the left hand side here, reflects off the primary mirror or main mirror. So it comes in through here, reflects off the primary mirror, which is here, reflects then off the secondary mirror, which is up there, and then back down through a hole in the main mirror. The hole isn't a design floor, it is meant to be there. And then it goes through a filter wheel and then onto our detector. So the bigger the mirror that you have in your telescope, the more light that you collect. And that means the fainter the object that you can observe. So having a telescope that's, two, that's got a two meter um, primary mirror is absolutely brilliant for looking at deep sky objects, so things that are very, very far away, millions of light years away, um, or things that are very faint. Um, so maybe asteroids or comets in our solar system. They're not very good for looking at planets or the two meter telescopes aren't very good because the planets are actually very bright in our solar system um, compared to other objects. Bit more um, technical information because this is all stuff that we're going to be using um, and making use of when we use the telescope. The field of view of the telescope. So this is a measure of how much of the sky the telescope can see. So when we're using these telescopes, they've got what we call a fixed field of view. You can't zoom in and zoom out to see different size objects. It's a fixed area of sky. And just to put this into some sort of comparison, I've got this yellow disc here represents the full moon. So if we were to point the two meter telescopes at the full moon, this is how much of the full moon we'd be able to see. Um, so quite a small, portion really of the moon you wouldn't be able to see all of it just as an aside we are not allowed to point and we would we wouldn't be able to point the two meter telescopes at the full moon because it would just be so bright that it would fry the detector on the telescope so there, there are safeguards in in place um, I don't set this as a challenge um, but you can't really break the telescope so if you're thinking, oh, I wouldn't want to use the telescope, it cost me five million pounds, or it cost, you know, Dill Forks five million pounds. Don't worry about it. It's, um, it's easy to use and you can't break it. We'll see. Um, so the field of view in technical terms is what we call 10 and a half arc minutes. So we use arc minutes as a measure of size in astronomy. And to explain what an arc minute is, so if we take this circle here, this full moon, how many degrees in a circle? 360 degrees. So if you imagine it, imagine cutting this circle into 360 segments. Each of those segments is one degree across. Take that one degree across segment, chop that into 60 slices again. Each of those slices is one arc minute. Okay, so We'll come back to that when I show you how we would plan a session and what will fit into the field of view of the, the telescope. Oops. The most technical part of using the telescopes is deciding what filter um, to use, really. Um, filters are used in telescopes to only allow particular wavelengths of light through to the camera. Um, 
The filters on the Fawkes telescope sit in a couple of filter wheels, which, um, which we can see in this image here. So this is a red filter, green filter, blue filter. I don't know what the other ones, I know there is a clear filter, um, but there are um, other, other filters that are on there now. I've got a very simplified picture here of a filter. So white light that we're measuring is made up of spectrum. So this is the, the spectrum of colors that we've got here. If you put a green filter over the detector, then essentially only green light will pass through that. So we would be measuring the intensity of light um, at those green wavelengths. If this is just an example, if you then put a red filter in front of that, you wouldn't have any light passing through because there's no red light in there to allow through there. If we get a bit more um, advanced, so this is the electromagnetic spectrum and here's visible light here going from about 400 nanometers up to 700 nanometers. So this is the spectrum of visible light. R here stands for the red filter, okay? But what you can actually see, this is the wavelength coverage of the filter. So it doesn't just cover a very small part of the red part of the spectrum, it does actually cover other wavelengths. And this is represented sort of graphically here. This is a, a plot of the transmittance, so how much light a filter allows through as a percentage. And these are just different names of the filter bands. So this is R, sometimes it's a lowercase r, sometimes it's a capital R, it just depends on the manufacturer of the filter. You can see here that if you use the R filter, then you'll be picking up light from about 550 nanometers up to just past 700 nanometers. And what this actually means um, sort of physically when we're using the telescope is that we can bring out, just by taking images using different filters, we can bring out different parts of the same object. So if I try and be clever, whoops, that's not being clever. I'm trying to get the, I wanted to annotate, there we are. Right, so for those of you who know about black body curves, so um, essentially a black body is just a, a sort of, um, I'll draw a black body on here if I can. Um, a plot of how much light um, or what radiation an object is emitting over all wavelengths. Um, Sarah, lost... we're, not, we're not seeing anything. Your animation isn't showing up. No, I've lost my mouse. Bother. Yeah, I've lost my mouse. Um... Well, that didn't work. <laughs> um... Okay, well, I'll... I'll leave that for now then. Um, but basically, you can, you can see the... Um, sorry, I'm just trying to find my mouse so I can point to things. Um, you, can, you can see the images at the bottom of the screen there. So this is an image of the Eagle Nebula. So this is M16, is his technical name. Um, and this is um, a region where stars are being, new stars are being formed. So it's a star formation region. And what you can see, um, so the left image where it says BVR, that's a color image of the star formation region. So it's essentially red, green, and blue image piled together to get a color image. Then you've got a U filter image, a B filter image, V, which stands for visible. It's essentially green. That's what wavelength of light our eyes are most um, sensitive to. Then at the bottom, you've got R, you've got I, and then H alpha is hydrogen alpha and O, and that's Roman numeral three, that's oxygen three. So what you're seeing there is a difference between what actually comes out of the image when you're using different filters. So hotter objects emit more light at shorter wavelengths. So a hotter object in space would appear bluer. A cooler object in space would appear redder. So if you look at the, the B image of the um, Eagle Nebula there, you're seeing the region where all the bright stars in there, you're seeing um, 
they're the bluer ones, so they're brighter in the um, B band. And then with the I band image of the, at the bottom, you can see a lot more stars in there. And that's because the cooler stars are actually more visible um, at these longer wavelengths. Now I'm hoping... Someone suggested unplugging your mouse and plugging it back in. I would, but I'm using trackpad on my Mac. Bother. Yeah, it is a bother because... Um... Oh, hold on. Do you have a backup mouse with a wire? Oh, my mouse is back. I'm not, I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to try and, and annotate this picture as I was going to, um, cause it's too risky. Um, but I just wanted to show you the different filters. So we've got, I think about just under 10 minutes before the start of our observing session. Um, I just wanted to finish off this, this part of the introductory talk, showing some of the images that you can actually take with the telescopes. So these are images that have been taken by schools in the past. So in the top left here, we've got the um, M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. I absolutely love this picture. It's, it's a spiral galaxy. You're seeing it face on, so like the flat of my hand here. Spiral galaxies, like if you rotated them so that they're edge on, quite often you'll hear people say that they look like two fried eggs stuck together. I say they look like a pregnant Frisbee. Um, but you basically have the bulge in the center, so that's what you're seeing here, and then you have the disk of new stars forming here. Um, I'll talk more, I'll go in more depth um, later about what we're actually seeing in each of these pictures. But I think that one of the nice things about this object apart from the fact that it's a beautiful galaxy is it's it's cannibalizing a, a satellite galaxy so you rarely find galaxies in isolation even giant galaxies have what's called um satellite or dwarf galaxies orbiting them um, and more often than not um they end up in what they call a cosmic dance where the smaller galaxy plunges through the larger galaxy and gets rips, ripped to shreds. And that's, that's what we're seeing in the process here. On the right hand side, this is the antennae galaxy. So this is two giant galaxies um, interacting with each other, two giant spiral galaxies, and they are in the process of merging. This middle picture is the Triffid Nebula. So um, this is an area of um, star formation. So there are stars actually being formed in this huge cloud of gas and dust. The dust lanes are the black bits here and they essentially block the optical light from reaching us. So that's why they appear dark in here. We've got a star here at the end of its life. So if you've done life cycle of stars, um, you might have heard of the phrase planetary nebulae. It's got nothing to do with planets at all. Um, but this is, a st this is the stage um, of stellar evolution that the sun will get to at the end of its life. So after it's used up all its hydrogen fuel and um, puffed out to become a red giant um, and then puffed out when it gets to the end of the, the nuclear reactions at that stage, it puffs out its outer material fairly gently really and what you're left is a white with is a white dwarf at the center and the expanding shallow gas out here. This is a globular cluster so this is um, thousands of stars held together in quite a dense concentration of stars held together by gravity. Older stars these are and you tend to find the globular clusters sort of orbiting around in what's called a halo. So if you imagine our our spiral galaxy, and you imagine like a halo going round, that's where the globular clusters are, not in the spiral arms. Um, and then this is the picture I showed before, the Eagle Nebula. I still can't see an eagle in it, but, but astronomers have uh, creative minds, I think. Um, and this is a, another site where stars are actually being formed um, in, these, in these massive columns of gas and dust. Right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second and swap over. And this is the moment of truth. Um, as I say, I haven't checked the weather in Hawaii. So I hope you've all had your fingers crossed. So 
when you have a real time session on the telescope, you, you can contact the Folks Telescope Project and our admin person would send, um, would send out um, times and dates of when there are real time sessions available. And it's um, nominally Tuesday to Friday, half an hour in the morning, half an hour in the afternoon. Um, you get sent an observing token, which is a string of numbers and letters like this. And five minutes before the start of your session, you go to the login page um, for the control interface. You put your observing token in and then you click begin session. You have no idea how nervous I am <laughs> doing this to see whether the session is available. Oh, right. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh, I'm excited now. Sorry, right. I'll explain to you why I'm excited. Because that's, this, that's a picture of the sky now. This is a picture of the sky now above the telescope. Um, it's not the best picture. So there, there's a webcam on the telescope and the, the telescope observatory. And this is what we're seeing now. This band here is it's what we call the Milky Way. It's one of the spiral arms in our galaxy. Okay, lots of um, new young stars being formed there in groups of stars called open clusters. What I'd like you to look at though also, there's a few bright things in the sky here. They're actually planets. And if we get a chance afterwards, I'll show you um, Stellarium and we'll, we will be able to identify which planets these are. Now, this is the screen that you will see when you um, start your um, observing session. It says welcome undefined. <laughs> it's not that it doesn't have a defined welcome for me. It's just that it, I haven't identified myself as Sarah. Um, so it's just undefined there. It's got the current time here. And you'll notice the time here is, so it says 14.12. For those of you in the UK, you'll be looking at your clock saying, well, it's not, it's not 2.12, it's actually 3.12 at the moment. Astronomers use universal, uh, universal coordinated time, which is abbreviated UTC. I, I don't know why UTC. Um, this is essentially the standard that astronomers use. Because there are so many different time zones in the world, we have a standard so that if we say, okay, an observation is at this time in this specific time zone, then at least all astronomers know to work to that time zone. It's, the, it's essentially the same as Greenwich Mean Time. So because we're in um, British summertime at the moment, we're an hour ahead of um, Greenwich Mean Time. So that's why it's actually 10 past or 13 minutes past uh, three for us, but universal time, it's nearly quarter past two. That's the one thing that you have to get your head around when you're using the telescopes. Our session starts in just over a minute um, and then it ends after half an hour. There's information, um, we don't want to exit, there's help here, there's information about the status because it says we're logged in to observe on the Fox Telescope North. I'm very excited that this is working. Um, the session hasn't yet started, we've still got a minute, and it's telling me that the observatory is available, the telescope, the camera and the progress unavailable at the moment because we haven't started our session. And then the other cool webcam image here. This is a wide, uh, live webcam of Fox Telescope North in Hawaii. So, oh, did you, did you all see the shooting it's star a then? shooting star. Wow, that's cool. And I honestly, this isn't fake or anything, that was real. Um, what's, what's so good about this is at this time in this day, we are the only people in the world who are going to be controlling this telescope. Nobody else has access to this telescope. So when you have a session, if you're using it from home or in school, you are the ones in control. Um, you can see, because I showed you the picture of the telescope, so you can see um, the tube and the, this is where the primary mirror is in, so we can see whether the light would reflect off there. Um, we've got, oh, it's a countdown, five seconds before our session starts. So this is the, oh, the telescope's available, the telescope is tracking, the camera's idle, all green here means with, that we're good to go. So this is the simplest way of using the telescopes. 
okay and you don't necessarily have to have planned a session on the telescope to use this because what you can do all the information that you need to input is just here on the left hand side so if you if you had planned a session and i have been good i have planned a session so i will type some objects in here then you can put the information in here if you hadn't planned a session then if you click on list it will give you a list of all sorts of things that are visible in the sky above the telescope at the moment it will also give you um, an idea of what sort of um, time you should use for the exposure time so let me have a look see what was in here so one of the objects that i was going to look at was a globular cluster m2 so if i click on <laughs> if i click on here nothing happens um if i click on m2 it should automatically populate these two boxes so what we've got here we've got the name of the object and then we've got the right ascension and the declination this is essentially the longitude and the latitude of the object in the sky so on the earth we use longitude and latitude to measure the coordinates of an object um, in the sky we measure right ascension and declination um, so this is a globular cluster which is a cluster of older stars they're cooler stars and they're redder stars so i'm going to use a red filter for my first image and the exposure time i'm going to use i'm just going to do a short one a 10 second one now i'll click go because i'll carry on talking as as this starts moving so what we'll see now is okay so the telescope is thinking about what i've just asked it to do and now it's going to move to the target so you should be able to see oh this is so cool you should be able to see the telescope moving in the webcam here so we've sent it a request i've sent it a request from cardiff and then on the other side of the world this massive beast is actually moving to look at the object in the sky eyes of a bus ladies and gentlemen yep <laughs> oh and it's already exposing there we are i should say so this what will happen now is so it's taken it's taken a picture of m2 this globular cluster and we should get the raw image um showing up on the screen here where it says most recent image data is pending it will show up in the table shortly because that for the whole session all the target oh i'll scroll up in a minute i'll keep the suspense going but the information and the images that you take will be shown in this table okay so that's our first image and wow. you might you might not be that impressed with it um because it's quite overexposed at the center there um but if i it might be too soon to do this yeah it's a little bit too overexposed at the center but you can you can see this is a very very dense concentration of stars here and very very bright towards the center so what i will do next then is i'll take a b band image a blue image i'll change my exposure time well no i'll i'll keep it at 10 just so that um they're all equal because what we can do is then take um, a green image with a visible um, filter for 10 seconds and we can actually put the three frames on top of each other and make a color image in there so most most of the time when when um teachers or school school pupils are using the telescopes or when they see it for the first time they say well sarah it's all very well putting 10 seconds in the exposure time but how do i know what the exposure time should be um so it is part of the planning and we do have resources to explain this um it depends on how bright the object is and you can the best way the way that i do it is i have a, a rough idea okay so this is our second image showing up there um i'll wait for it to say preview um so if i have a look at this one oops 
I don't want to download the fits file. So this is our blue image of the globular cluster, not quite as bright at the center, but still quite bright because it's such a concentration of stars um, in the center. I am going to do a V, a green image for 10 seconds because I think it might generate a color image without me having to do anything. Um, but yeah, I was going to say the the general um, rule of thumb, I suppose, for globular clusters, which are, are densely packed stars, I would do anything from maybe two seconds up to 15 seconds. And the thing is, if I was doing this um, in front of a class or if I was doing this for, for a project, or the lab, webcam's gone down, um, then I might start with as I did a 10 second exposure and think, oh, well actually that is overexposed. So the next one, I would do the same image, but then I would decrease the exposure time to maybe two seconds. So you can, you can play about with it. The other thing that you can do is have a look at the data archive, and this is what I do, um, to see what other people have done looking at the same images, what exposure time did they use, was it a nice image? Was it overexposed, underexposed? And then just basically steal their exposure time. So we've got a red, green, and blue image. I'm wondering whether it will show us the, um, oops, the color image or not. But that's our green image. Okay, I'll wait to see whether a color one becomes um, available. So that's a globular cluster. Now, I am partial to a galaxy. My, my PhD was in galaxies, and I think galaxies are absolutely beautiful. So I'm going to look at a, ooh, a group of galaxies next. But I'm going to type in the name of the galaxy and hope that it auto-populates this. No, in which case I'll find it on here. Hicks and Concat Group 92. Now I don't know whether, whether the RA and DEC moved then at all or not. Let me just... Well, we'll do a test. No, I didn't. So I'm going to cancel that because there seemed to be a glitch in the system then. So when I chose, okay, now it's changing. When I chose the group of galaxies there, I don't think the RA and DEC actually changed. The telescope should move. Say move into target now. Okay, that's better. The webcam seems to have gone down. So we can't watch the webcam. Uh, we can't watch the telescope moving, which is unfortunate. Um, the other thing to consider when you are planning an observing session with the telescope um, is, and I'll show you this in Stellarium. Essentially, if we looked at, so the globular cluster M2, I know was somewhere um, towards the, the zenith, so directly overhead. What we don't want to do, if you look at my mouse, is to choose an object on this side of the sky, and then the second object, choose one over here, and then the third object, move it over here, and then move it there, because it does take time to move the telescope to the target. So to get the most out of your observing session, Ideally, you should choose objects that are fairly close to each other, or you observe them in a way that you would choose an object here, and then there, and then there, and then, you know, just hopping across rather than just doing what I'm doing now and randomly choosing objects um, in the sky. Let's see if there's a... I was hoping that there'd be a... Um other image that's processed automatically. When you go to the data archive, and there's a link to the data archive here, so all the images that you take 
are saved automatically. Um, you don't need to worry about downloading them straight away. They're all saved in the archive, so it's worth saving the link, um, if nothing else. Um, and then in the archive, you can actually see the, um, the images in there. Right. So this is now tracking the object. So the earth is moving. We all know that the earth is moving. We have day and night. Um, and the sky is essentially fixed. So the telescope does have to track the object. It has to move along at the same rate that the earth is rotating so that you don't get streaks. So the stars are actually perfect circles instead of streaks, which has happened in the past when the telescope um, hasn't tracked properly in there. So I'll tell you a little bit about M2 here, this globular cluster. Sorry, that's not the best picture in the world. Um, this is, um, so M, when I'm saying M2, the M stands for Messier, which is named after Charles Messier, who was a French astronomer. And he was interested, I think this was uh, 17th, 17th or 18th century. He was a comet chaser. So he enjoyed observing comets. And what he noticed when he was looking for comets in the sky was that there were loads of fuzzy objects that could be mistaken by comet hunters. And so he thought, well, I will do a list of all these fuzzy objects so that other comet hunters aren't confused and they don't mistake them as comets. And what he ended up with was a list of a hundred and just over a hundred objects, um, which we now call the Messier catalog. And they turned out to be things like galaxies, uh, star clusters, star formation regions, basically deep sky objects that look fuzzy in not very good telescopes, but obviously when you've got a two meter telescope looking at these objects, then they become a lot more, um, lot more interesting. So this is one of the oldest globular clusters that's known. Um, it's roughly 13 billion years old. Um, it's, 55,000 light years from Earth. So astronomers use different units to measure distances in space. So space is very big, as I'm sure you all know. Um, and um, a light year is the distance that it takes lights to travel in one year. And we, we wouldn't be able to use things like miles or meters or kilometers when we're talking about space, just because the numbers would end up talking about trillions or zillions of kilometers when we're talking about distance. So as, um, astronomers use um, light years um, as a measure of distance in space. So this is 55,000 light years away from us. And essentially we're seeing, the, so the light that left this object that's reached our telescope today left this object 55,000 55, years ago. So this object probably looks quite different now. Um, if we could get in a spacecraft and fly all the way over there, obviously not possible. Um, but what you might hear astronomers saying that we're actually sort of looking back in time. That's what they mean when they say we're, we're looking back in time. This next object, which I hope it's taken the, the, the image of, we'll see in four seconds, is a group of galaxies. Um, it's part of the Hickson Compact Group of Galaxies. Um, so Paul Hickson, an American astronomer, um, catalogued galaxies that looked visually on the screen like they were very close to each other on a small area of sky. Oh, this, don't worry about it. It will look nicer in a minute. Um, this is actually quite beautiful. You can see all the galaxies in here. All this stuff around here is, um, so this is the raw image that we are seeing. So if I scroll to the preview image, what we're seeing here is a result of dust on the um, filter or on the detector. There's some so a random electronic noise that's on there. It's all subtracted um, in a process at the end of the observer night. But we can get a quick preview of this object, which is hmm, half clean. Um, but it's not all taken out there. But can you see 
these galaxies here. So this is known as Stefan's Quintet. Um, so we've got some a barred spiral galaxy here. So this is a spiral galaxy with um, a bar running through the center. We've got just a normal galaxy, another barred spiral, um, and this is another, um, another spiral galaxy. I think there's another galaxy somewhere, but I can't see it in the mess here, that isn't physically associated with this cluster. Um, but the four of them are associated. Um, right, let's see if we can have a nice spiral galaxy. I'm going to do a 30 second exposure because I'm sure we'll still be able to see it anyway. I'm going to choose the red filter just because it might look a bit faint because there aren't that many cooler, older, redder stars in a spiral galaxy. Spiral galaxies tend to be full of um, younger, bluer stars because that's where you get lots of new star formation um, going on. Um, but I'm going to do a red filter just because I know that um, that the the first image will look better. You don't get as much of the the dust and the the noise in the red filter image as you do in the in the the blue image. Um, oh, sorry, I showed you the, I didn't show you the processed one. I showed you. Oh, here we are. Oh, see, that's much nicer. So the one I showed you before. Sorry, I clicked on previews. So that was the uncleaned image. This is the cleaned image. Oh. Isn't this beautiful? Every time I see an image with a telescope, I honestly, I think they're absolutely gorgeous. So here we have, there's a, there's a galaxy here. Um, I think this is the one that isn't associated. So it's part of the compact group, but it's not physically. When, when you look at the redshift of the galaxies, um, this one is a lot further behind um, these galaxies here. These are two interacting galaxies. Um, this galaxy, this barred spiral galaxy, can you see what's called this tidal tail here? This shows that this galaxy has interacted with another galaxy um, in the past. And actually, if you have a look at interacting galaxies using radio telescopes, what you tend to see, because this is a stream of um, hydrogen gas here, if you point a radio telescope at things like this, then you can quite often join up with the other galaxy, the stream of gas, you can't see it in the optical, but you can with the radio wavelengths, um, look at the hydrogen and you can see which galaxies are interacted with which. Um, and this is an elliptical galaxy here. This streak going across here, so this is um, most likely to be a satellite. Um, occasionally you do get stray asteroids coming across your um, image as well um, and yeah there's, there's not a lot you can do about that except for when you're processing it later um, then you can um, sort of remove it from the image oh okay so this is our spiral galaxy if I show you the processed image of this oh m33 okay so, this is the Triangulum Galaxy, which is actually, um, it's too big for the field of view of our telescope. Okay, so it's about 20 arc minutes in size, whereas our field of view is 10 and a half arc minutes. So we're seeing that the central part of it. This is, yeah, it's classed as a spiral, loosely classed. Um, you can see the center part of this galaxy, um, but if you took a lovely um, color image of this, then you'd be able to see that this is all sort of a star formation region that's going on here. Now, I wonder what I've got here. I'll take an image of open cluster. So, an open cluster, so we, we've taken an image of a globular cluster. Let me just check how much time, we've got 10 minutes, that's plenty. We've taken an image of a globular cluster and that's a very 
densely concentrated um, concentration of stars held together by gravity. An open cluster is a looser grouping of stars still held to together by gravity, but these are younger, bluer stars. So these are stars which have fairly recently formed, really. I'm going to... I'm not going to do 120 seconds. That's, that's probably too long. I'll do a 30 second exposure just as a test. It's executing my request and we should be able to see the telescope moving to target in a minute. So You'll be able to see the difference between what a globular cluster looks like and an open cluster, and you'll see why they're called open clusters. There are some very pretty open clusters. Have to be careful what I say here, because um, I am a galaxies person, so I think galaxies are just the best things in the universe. But I've got colleagues who do a lot of um, star research, stellar research, and they think that stars are the best things in the universe, but they're wrong. Um, but anyway, um, quite often open clusters can be slightly disappointing because it's just a few stars in the field and nothing as beautiful as a galaxy. But we'll see. You, you might have your own opinions. Feel free to put in the Q&A if, you, if you'd rather a, a, a cluster of stars than, than a galaxy. Um, and also, I, I'm not watching the Q&A at the moment, um, but I, I know um, Simon is. If anyone has any requests for what we can observe or a type of object that we can observe, then feel free to put it in there and Simon can, can um, sort of tell me what you've asked for. Yep. Um, so it should be reading out now. So as I say, the first, this image that we see here won't look very nice because of all the, all the, um, the gunk, if you like, on it. So if I just wait for the processed image to show up in the table. Then we'll be able to see it looking much better. Sarah, do you have any insight into what the processing software is? Someone has, has asked about uh, oh, it's, what they're using. Oh, well, um, it's not a particular package of software. It's, um, it goes through what they call a pipeline. Oh, there we are. There's our open cluster of stars. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, where it's, it's a bunch of stars. What can you say? No, it's, I'm sure it is very pretty and it would look pretty if we had the, the color image of it. Um, but what you, what you can see with this, you can see that there is more of an over density of stars in here. And what you would be able to do is plot um, the HR diagram, Hirschsprung-Russell diagram, which I'll talk about afterwards. Um, but some of you may have heard of that um, before. Um, but just to give you a comparison of this and a globular cluster. Um, We've had requests coming in. Um, go on then. Someone's asked for the Eagle Nebula. Uh, someone's asked for the Sombrero Galaxy. Right. Uh, I don't Ryan know. Who? N NGC 3372. Is that, a that must be a galaxy, I'm guessing. It might not be, but it's not on this list, so I don't think... Um, so not the right time of year for Orion. No. Where's the sombrero? Sombrero. Right, who's asked for sombrero? I'm going to have to do a quick Google search to see what the name Actually, of sombrero is. Crab Nebula's come up. That's in... That's, that's in is that up here? That. M1 is the Crab Nebula. Not there. It's not here. Well... What I can do though, I've got Stellarium running. I was going to explain this to you all. Um, oh, actually you can't see Stellarium, can you? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll just... The Sombrero I know is very nice, but I don't know what the... Uh, come what come the... Planetary Nebula. Yes. That's my request. That's okay. Oh, sorry, everyone. <laughs> no, I, I will try and do one of the others as well afterwards. Now, NGC 7293, is that here? 7293? Right. 
it's a long have we got any lord of the rings fans because what i'm going to look at here if it works 7293 is just 7293 this is a planetary nebula um let's i think i'll do a Hmm. I'm going to do 30 seconds. I'll do red for now. I'll click go. The reason I asked if we had any Lord of the Rings fans is because this planetary nebulae is also known as the Eye of Sauron. And hopefully you'll be able to see why it's called that when we take the image of it. Um, so it's moving to the target. We've got four minutes remaining. Um, Whilst we're waiting for this, I'll just do a quick search on my phone for the Sombrero Galaxy. Um, Sombrero Galaxy M104. No, that doesn't seem to be visible either, or at least not on this list. Um, so a planetary nebula, um, I showed you an image of a planetary nebula in my introductory talk. That was M57, um, also called, um, I think that was the ring nebula that I showed you, because it looks like a ring. Um, so astronomers can be creative, but they can also be a bit um, obvious and boring with their descriptions and namings. Um, and this is essentially... Um, sort of the end point of a star with a similar mass to the sun. So once it's gone through its adult stage um, where it's fusing hydrogen in its core, um, once it's gone past that stage um, and it's moved on to what's called a sort of red giant or past the red giant phase, so it goes to the red giant phase next. Um, and then once it moves past that and essentially gravity can't hold it together, the, the pressure, the, the pressure from the nuclear reactions in the center so push the material out. That's what you're seeing with the planetary nebula. You're seeing the gas as it sort of comes out there. And what you're left with at the center is the core of the star, essentially, the, the white dwarf. So I'm hoping that this is going to look good. Don't forget, um, when I show you Stellarium, we're going to try and identify these bright things here, okay? Because they are planets. The reason I haven't observed a planet with this is because we'd have to use an exposure time of something like 0.01 seconds and the images that you get, it's, it's literally a white blob. This telescope is too big to look at planets. They're just ooh, too bright. Oh, look at that. Sorry, I was interrupted then by the eye of Sauron staring at me. That is cool. Um, oh, I like that. I'm going to see if I can quickly get a green and a blue image of this because then what I can do is link to the image archive and it will automatically generate a colour image if it, send, if it reads that there's a red, green and blue image. Somebody um, has, has uh, requested a, an RGB combination. Of this? Of anything. Of I anything. Think, I don't think you, you did one for the first object you looked at. I did for M2. So what we'll do when what we'll do when this session finishes is I'll click on this link and I'll show you the data archive, which looks horrendously complicated because it's the same archive that the professional astronomers use as well. Um, yeah. But don't worry, because if you were doing this yourselves, apart from the fact that we are here to help you in the Fox Telescope project, okay, so there's the processed image. Oh, that is beautiful. Um, you can see that it doesn't quite fit in the field of view either. Um, just a bit too big for it. But with, with the archive, we do have resources that explain sort of step by step with screenshots exactly how you can access the, the data. OK, so that was a green. So I'm going to do a blue. I'm trying to do this really quickly just so that we can get it in there. Oh, we're almost out of time. Yeah, we've got. 
Oh, it says naught minute. It, it might tell me that there's, I'm surprised it didn't say there wasn't enough time. Mm. It'll take about a hundred seconds to complete. Yeah, I don't, I think we're out of luck with this. Oh, our sessions ended. <sighs> See, now this is a lesson in why you should prepare your observing session beforehand. Um, because as I say, I mean, we were, I had prepared it. Um, and then I went off off topic by asking for um, suggestions, but we were zipping all over the sky. Um, but you can take we did still take a lot of images, actually, but you can you can get a lot more images in your session if you just plan the session properly. Or if you're a teacher watching this and you get your students to plan the session. Um, that's a nice homework task for them. So if I click on this link here, and I'm hoping you'll be able to see this. Would this link be available to anybody or is it private to you? No, all the data is available to everybody, but that specific link is just available to me. Um, in fact, Although what I will do is I won't close down this and because everyone has been part of this observing session, I can make this link available. Um, we can send this out to everybody. That's um, actually a tremendous idea. Yeah. Um, so as I said, this, this archive is actually used by everyone who uses the telescope network. And the telescope network isn't just for education, professional astronomers use it. In fact, they use most of it. Um, so a lot of what's on here is not designed um, for educational users, which is unfortunate, but um, we have resources to explain it. And actually, I think once someone has shown it to you, it's not too difficult to see what's going on. So this is all the data all the images that we took today. So the most obvious thing you can see here is the name of the object. We've got the name of the filter, the type of observation. We basically did an exposure um, as opposed to um, doing part of the, the data processing. Oh, I didn't answer that question. Remind me actually, it's, it's a pipeline processing that the astronomers have actually written themselves. So it's not pre-packaged software package that they use. Um, but I can show you where you can get information about that afterwards. The exposure times that we used and then um, the base name. So this is, so OG2M, that is, OG is the code for the telescope site, OGG. So two meter telescope, and then this is the name of the camera, and then it's the date, and then it's um, just a number of the, which image was taken. And then the E00 or the E91 just tells you whether it's been processed or whether it's still the raw image. Um, so we're not interested in the raw images because they're the ones that look horrible. We're interested in the reduced ones. So the reduced um, is basically, it's been through the, the pipeline processing. So which one? So at the very beginning, M2 was the one that we took a color image of. So we took a red, a blue and a green. I should say that the, the observing interface is going to change slightly in the next few months because instead of having to do a separate red, green and blue image um, and then putting them together yourselves, there's gonna be an option to just take a color image, um, which will be much easier. So if I click on this, so I've, I've clicked on the cross and of my M2 image. If I click on this image here, I think, there should be, it might be too soon to do this, but there's normally a link that says, we've um, noticed that you took a, a red, a green and a blue image. Do you want to see this as a color one? Or well, maybe I have to, do I want to view the headers? I think it's too soon to see these, to be honest. 
But if I wanted to, for example, see um, um, what other people had done, I can search the data archive here. Um, I'm thinking whether to, so I can change the, so we've got a custom range. So this is just showing me what we took today. In the last 30 days, I can look at what objects were taken and there's all these things. So from Hawaii on the two meter telescope in the last 30 days, all these objects were taken, all these images. If I just go to page five, I'll see if I can find a color image of something. Oh, there's some interesting sounding objects. Maybe this one. Yeah, for some reason, the links aren't showing up. Um, well, there is, there is some way of seeing the raw color file, but I can't at the moment see how to do that. Um, so, okay, I'll have to, I'll have to find that and then I can, I can send that information to you anyway. Um, but the, the other thing that you can do um, is you can select which files you want to download and then click on um, download. Okay, so you can download them straight to your screen. What I should say um, is the images or the data files that you get are not image files. They're, they're called FITS files, F-I-T-S, which stands for Flexible Image Transport System. Um, and that means that you need specialist software to see them because you get the image, but you also get what's called a header, which is information, a lot of information that you really don't need to know, but information about where the telescope is pointing, um, what filter you use in, the exposure time you used, um, all sorts of information, okay? Um, but that's why you can't just use simple um, it won't show up just in, in photo editor or whatever in, in Windows or photo viewer. Um, but there's free software that you can use. Um, so Photoshop, you can use it if you've got a plugin to open fits files, um, the GIMP as well, or GIMP shop you can use. Um, and there's lots of, lots of links on, on the website. Um, what I wanted to show you, um, quickly, because, um, we're going to be finishing soonish. Just to give you a sort of taster of what sort of things you can do with the telescope. So I've shown you how to use the, the telescopes to take data uh, or to take images. But there are so many things that you can use the telescopes for. It's not just about pretty pictures. You can do real research and real science with the telescopes. And one of the things that we try and do with the Fawkes Telescope Project is get students in contact with either professional or amateur astronomers to actually do real research projects. And we have had students make new discoveries and also be on astronomical papers and research papers as well with their data. So it is something that you can do um, from school. So I'll, I'll go through this pretty quickly, um, but obviously any questions I can answer um, at the end. We've shown some examples of the types of things that you can observe with the telescopes. And I've, I've mentioned looking at solar system, uh, planets in the solar system, with a two meter telescope is no good because the telescope collects so much light, those objects are much too bright. So we can look at deep sky objects and we can look at asteroids and comets because they are actually very small and very faint objects in our solar system and the two meter telescopes are brilliant for picking up and finding new asteroids or comets and we can also look at exoplanets and exoplanet transits so an extra extra exoplanet or extrasolar planet is a planet that is um orbiting a star outside our solar system so another star in our galaxy and if you watch um if you've got your star here and you've got a planet 
cross in the front of it, you can actually measure the dip in the light as the planet crosses across the face of the star. So it's something that we have had students do. Starting off with some um, random ones, cross curricular projects. We had a school up in Scotland who used the telescope um, quite a few years ago for their French lesson. So they learned about Charles Mestier and they did a sort of French poster about who is Charles Messier and let's do some images of some Messier objects so you can do some cross-curricular things. Art and science with the telescopes, we've seen some beautiful images um, and these are some images which um, were obviously edited afterwards by the school students um, because you don't get a smiley face open cluster so they've added their own things and own special effects there but you can you know you can be very creative with the pictures that you get but you can do a lot of science for the pictures so you can look at beautiful things like galaxies I told you I was biased towards them um, but there's real science going on in there so these are two pictures of giant galaxies so this is an elliptical galaxy called M87 this is a spiral galaxy, so this is M51. Two very different galaxies. Both of these galaxies have a supermassive black hole at the center of them. It, you can't tell that by just looking at an optical image um, of M51, this galaxy here. You can't, it was only, what was it, last April that the first image of a black hole, a supermassive black hole, was actually taken. Um, and it was taken by a telescope called the Event Horizon Telescope, which was essentially 10 radio telescopes all linked together to make a telescope with a diameter nearly of the Earth, diameter of the distance between Spain and the South Pole, actually, was the diameter of the telescope, essentially. Um, that's the sort of, you know, that, that was the first image of a black hole that was taken. That image um, that was taken of that black hole, they were looking at this galaxy here which is M87. And I love this picture of M87. Um, it's an elliptical galaxy, so it doesn't have a lovely spiral, beautiful stru spiral structure. It's elliptical galaxies range in ball shaped to rugby ball shaped. But what you can see in this image is a jet coming out of the center of the galaxy. So this is classed as an active galaxy. It's got an active galactic nucleus. We know that there's a supermassive black hole that's feeding in the middle there and it's spewing out material. And what we can actually do, and schools have done this, is they can measure the physical size of the jet that's coming out here. So pretty pictures, but they've got science. This is the beautiful Whirlpool galaxy. It's got a supernova. So these lines are artificially added, um, but this is a supernova explosion. So this is a star that's at least 10 times the mass of our sun that's reached the end of its life. And when one of those goes off, it can outshine the whole galaxy. So it looks like there's a suddenly a new star in the galaxy. Um, and we've been working with astronomers in Cambridge University on something called the, the ESA, European Space Agency Gaia mission. And that mission is to map a billion stars in our galaxy um, and make unprecedented, um, take unprecedented data of the positions, the brightnesses and their motions. But as the Gaia satellite is spinning in space and scanning the sky over and over and over again, it is spotting new objects coming on and going off. So it's spotting new supernovae, it's spotting asteroids going past it, it's spotting stars that are varying in brightness. Um, and we've had school students, high school students, looking at um, supernovae that have just been discovered with Gaia we got the, the information about where to point the telescope to first, and they did the, the follow-up of those observations and plotted a beautiful graph, which I can show you after. Um, you can do the life cycle of stars, um, oops, with the, with the telescope as well, um, and you can plot what's called Hirschsprung-Russell diagrams. Um, so you can't see my screen at the moment, can you? I'm not sharing. Um, let me just share this again. So some of you will be familiar with a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, some of you won't. It's basically a plot of the temperature of a star against its luminosity. So temperature going from cool to hot, from faint to bright. So this is an open cluster of stars. This is a globular cluster of stars. Um, 
and basically what you're doing is you can get you get an aperture so you get a circle you place it over every single star in the image or as many as you can and you do a plot of its color which is um, a measure of its temperature against its brightness essentially and you make your own HR diagram so if it's got a long band across here this band is called the main sequence you know it's a young star cluster if it's an old if it's an old cluster it has a shorter main sequence and the reason that I wanted to show you this is because I know it's on the you used to be on the curriculum but also we had a, a project student who did this sort of thing with us um, this is his plot of the main sequence very bunched up there but you'll see that he actually named a load of stars there because as he was doing this just work experience year 12 he discovered a load of new variable stars so stars that brighten and fade and brighten and fade and he discovered new ones that hadn't been discovered before just quite accidentally um, we can hunt for asteroids with the telescopes so I'll show you this picture so this is an image of the sky um, so looking at the stars here can you spot the asteroid you won't be able to spot it if I, if I turn invert the colors it makes it slightly easier but what we have to do because the stars stay in the same place when we take an image and a moving object like an asteroid, if you scroll through a few images, so take an image of the same patch of sky three times, anything that's moving is an asteroid or a comet, unless it's a streak and then that's, that's a satellite. So can anyone spot, and Simon will have to tell me if people have said yes, so just saying yes or no in the Q&A, can anyone spot an asteroid in this image? Can you spot a moving black dot? Oh, hundreds of yeses. Yeah? It's now I wonder, is it this one that you all spotted? I suspect it was. So this was the target asteroid that the school were looking for. Did any of you spot this one? There's another asteroid in this image, and this was actually an undiscovered asteroid, but it wasn't actually... Um, it wasn't claimed because the, the images weren't analyzed until afterwards and somebody else had already spotted it by that point. But we have had new asteroid discoveries um, with the telescopes. So you can make discoveries with the telescopes. We can look at how asteroids tumble in space because asteroids don't just sort of move across the sky like that. This is my, my prop. They actually rotate or they tumble as they move across space and you can see this is reflecting, um, this USB stick is reflecting different amounts of light. Asteroids do as well. So you can see them getting fainter and brighter and fainter and brighter as they move across. So this is the, the target asteroid here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish up in a minute because um, I've taken more time um, than I intended to. But I just wanted to um, finish off by saying... Um, I'll just share my screen again. Am I sharing? Yeah, there we are. Sharing my screen. Um, there is online access to the telescope network that anybody, um, not anybody in the world, but people related to or using it for education um, can access. Um, so it used to be, and it mostly is that we ask teachers to sign up for accounts um, and then you can use it in the classroom. To be honest, what you do with the account um, is up to you. If you wanted to then hand it over to the pupils, then that's absolutely fine if you, you, know, if you trust your pupils to do that. At the moment, because schools aren't really open or, or not as open as they could be, then what we're saying is that if you are a student in a school, you can apply for time on the telescopes. Okay, so I've shown you the real time session. So if you wanted to have a real time session on the telescope, um, time is quite limited at the moment, especially since we're moving into August and we don't have as much time available then, but you can use the telescopes. Otherwise, you can um, use the Q mode. And again, we've got resources that explain how to, how to use the Q mode. Um, but all you have to do is apply, um, you can either apply directly to me or um, through the website, 
but apply with your school email address and in the notes section explain that you've attended this webinar um, and that I have given permission for you to have a telescope account um, and then we can set one up for you. Um, and, I, and I should say, so some of the images that were taken here, most of them were taken by schools, some of them were taken by uh, students in Swansea University as well because the Fawkes Telescope project is based in Swansea University and Cardiff University. So undergrad students at those universities are allowed access to the telescopes. No other undergrad students in the UK generally are allowed access to the telescopes and they are research class telescopes. So it's something I, I have project students using the telescopes all the time and I, I use them in our lab as well. So if you're not lucky enough to get time on the telescopes whilst you're still in school, come to Swansea or Cardiff, but come to Swansea and then you can use the telescopes um, in our sessions. Okay, so I'll finish there. I'll finish with my presentation there. I do have slides that I've skipped over, but that's because I'm conscious that some of you may, um, you know, you've been in front of Zoom for a long time now, so you may want to, um, to leave, feel free. Um, but otherwise, I can have a look at if there's any questions um, that need answering. I left you all the easy ones, Sarah. You left me the easy ones, brilliant. <laughs> so we've still got quite a few people here. Oh, there's some people leaving, that's fine. Um, right, now I've got to work. Right, so, so Simon, am I right in thinking I look at the open questions? Yes, but it's okay to look at the answered ones as well because you may want to give a second opinion. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. There's a lot of questions here. A lot of people are saying yes when you, when, when you asked if they could see the asteroid. And there's a lot of requests for things that we didn't manage quite to see. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, I yeah. am wondering whether, yeah. Um, so, so but if, if, you have, if you have requests of something that you want to see, best thing to do is to apply for an account with the telescope and then take the images yourself. Because that's even better than having me sit in front of the uh, computer and, and do it. Um, right, so let me look at some of the questions. Okay, could we look at that? Do we work with men? Sorry, Simon. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, oh, hold on. No, he, yeah, there's, right, there's two questions. We're going to, sorry if you would have said, but what website do you use to book the telescope if you can? Yeah, I was going to show you this. Um, oops, stop sharing. Um, so the main website. So to set up an account on a telescope, you would go to the Fawkes Telescope Project website. So that's fawkes-telescope.com. And you can read all about us and see our resources there. Um, and there's a login or register button. So if you click on register, you can fill out the details on the form there. Um, and then when you have an account for the telescope, we send you um, information about how to get set up for the for the first observing session. We don't have a list of open research type questions on our website. It's another question on here. What we do have, um, we've got some information on projects. If I click on observing on our website, um, what we tend to do is um, so if, if an astronomer has said to us, oh, we've, we've got these targets and we really want you to do follow-up work, we put the information up on the exciting targets list. I don't think this has been updated in a while, um, but that's where you'll find some of the, the sort of time critical observations. The other thing I should say is um, if you wanted to do things like that using the telescopes, sort of time critical things that astronomers have requested, then if you join the Fawkes Telescope Project mailing list, we'll email them out to people. We're also on Facebook and we're on Twitter. So we'll also put a note on Facebook and Twitter to say, so-and-so at the University of Edinburgh has requested that we take images of this comet. Um, here are the observing details. Can you book a session and do it? Um, so that's how we tend to, tend to work. Um, do we work with engineers was what I was going to answer. Um, do we work with many engineers and if so, what do they do? 
I personally don't work with many engineers, but there was a, you can imagine that the engineering feat of getting these telescopes up and running was massive. In fact, when, so Folks Telescope North in Hawaii, when that was placed in Hawaii, that worked pretty much from the, from the get-go. That was um, engineered brilliantly. The one, the Folks Telescope South in Australia, when that was first placed there, um, I think we used it for a couple of weeks and then we, it was obvious that the quality of the images that we were getting was just absolutely awful. And it's because the foundation, foundations weren't good enough. Um, and so they had to basically, I had to think they had to replace all the concrete in the foundations because you, you don't want any slight tremor in it because then, you know, your telescopes can be moving everywhere. Um, so the engineering stuff is basically, if you had a look on the LCO web pages um, or contacted them, most of the people that, or a, a large fraction of the people that work in LCO are engineers. Um, not just physical sort of mechanical engineers either, software engineering as well, because one thing I didn't say, um, so professional astronomers and schools um, use these telescopes. You haven't seen a Q system, um, it's simple enough, you put in the, the name of your target, the coordinates, the exposure time, the filter, just like you do um, with a real time observing, but then you click submit and then the telescope scheduler itself works out, it schedules when is the best time to do that observing. And if you think back to the picture I showed you with all those telescopes, there's at least, at least 20 telescopes, I think in the network, it has to schedule it for all those, um, for all those telescope site location, has to take the weather into account, the observatory status, all sorts of things. Um, so software engineering is a massive part of what LCO do. Um, do. Right, yeah, so somebody's saying, yeah, RTI slots, very limited to schools during the summer, July and August. Um, yes, that is true. If you do have um, a group of students that you specifically want to be using the telescope with, um, then we can request there will be some real time slots in in August, but not as many as normal. But as, if you have specific um, project that you're doing with um, your AS students, then get in contact with me, um, and I will I will request more time, more RTI slots. Sarah, there's a question from uh, about the Stellarium. Is that something that you can show us? Yes. What's the What's the question? You mentioned what? the Stellarium, what is it? And can we use oh, it? Oh, sorry, yeah, okay. So, <laughs> oh, it's because, yeah, I keep clicking on Stellarium and then realizing that I'm not sharing the Stellarium screen, right. So Stellarium is nearly as good as the Fox telescopes. Don't tell anyone I said that. Um, Stellarium is absolutely brilliant. It's a planetarium software package that's free, so you can download it. And it shows you the nights, well, it shows you the sky above any location on the earth at any time and any date. So it's a very, very powerful tool, but it's really, really easy to use. So when you first, so this is the, the Stellarium screen. At the moment, I'm obviously pointing at an object because there's a load of um, text that's showing up here. When you first open Stellarium, um, it's centered on um, Paris, I think it is. Um, so it shows you the, the sky above Paris. But what you can actually do with Stellarium um, is you can scroll across the sky. So here's Jupiter and Saturn. I set it earlier to show me the sky in um, Hawaii. So there's a menu option on the left hand side in Stellarium and a menu option at the bottom of the screen. On the left hand side, if I go to location, I clicked in Hawaii. Have a look at the, um, the sky behind this pop-up this pop box here. I'm just gonna click in the UK. Watch notice. Something very strange, there's a bright ball in the sky there, the sun, don't normally see that. But it's daytime here, okay? In Hawaii, actually, it's not nighttime because the sun is rising now, I think, in there. Yeah, 
obviously, because we've just had night time. Um, if I went over to Australia, it's night time in Australia. But anyway, so I set the um, location to Hawaii. This is how I planned my session. And then I used the menu option and I changed the time and date to the time and date of my session. So this was, and it's in universal time. So 14.15 was the time of my session, 26th of June, 2020. Um, and this, so if I zoom out, this is the night sky above the telescope in Hawaii, as we were using the telescope. Now I've just, one thing I said to you all, when we were looking at the, um, the webcam, and the, the night sky webcam on the real time session, I said, remember these bright spots, didn't I? I said, we'll identify them with Stellarium. Well, those bright spots, so here's the Milky Way that we could actually see beautifully in the webcam. The bright spots were Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. We can see Venus there, just coming up, near Uranus there, okay? So you can identify different objects in the sky with um, Stellarium. And what I do for planning an observing session is in the bottom menu option, there's this deep sky object um, option. So if I click that on, it will show me objects which are perfect for observing with the telescope. So the Pegasus cluster. So if I click on this object here, press the space bar, I can zoom in on this object and perhaps see an image of it. Okay, so it's a globular cluster. Um, if I just move us out of the way. What you'll also see on the top left here is it tells me the name. So it's Messier 15 or NGC 7078. So these are different catalog names, acronyms. It's a globular star cluster. And then the important things that I look for is down here, the altitude of the object. So it's 76 degrees above the horizon. The telescopes won't look at anything or can't look at anything less than or below 25 degrees from the horizon and that's just because you saw the the um, clamshell design there's buildings around there it has they have the telescope has to point above buildings essentially and then the other thing is size so this globular cluster is 18 arc minutes not degrees 18 arc minutes not arc seconds so i know that if i took an image of this cluster using the Fox telescope which has a field of view of 10 and a half arc minutes I would get most of the cluster in the image, but there'd still be some on the outside. Okay. Um, I think that is Stellarium in a nutshell. You can do so, so much more. You can search for specific objects. In fact, what I will do now is somebody asked to see the Sombrero Galaxy. I'm going to see if the Sombrero Galaxy is visible it would help if you if i spell it some oh. some bro sombre bro i can't say it sombrero galaxy if i zoom out now right <laughs> what you're seeing here is the sombrero galaxy you can see from the altitude it's at minus 57 so it's actually below the horizon so it is sent, Stellarium has centered on the Sombrero galaxy, but it's underneath the ground. So in fact, if I zoom in, I can magically, if it shows up, you can remove the ground. You can use the transparent earth option. Yes. <laughs> and there it is, but it's, yeah, it's below, it's below ground. So we wouldn't have been able to see the Sombrero galaxy anyway. So yeah, I, I did want to um, show Stellarium because that's, it's the easiest way of planning an observing session. And it's also great because if you're outside um, in the evening and you see something really bright in the sky, you've probably got apps on your phone to do this, but you can have a look on Stellarium and say, oh, okay, so what is that object? Or have a look at Stellarium to see what the night sky is gonna look like tonight. And then you can amaze all your family and friends by saying, well, that object is this thing and that object is this, and this is the constellation of whatever. And you can sound really knowledgeable and it's just because you've been having a look on Stellarium. 
so you can put constellation labels and um and artwork and stuff on there as well um it's a very powerful um tool still there and it's brilliant okay If we went to study a different subject in Swansea University, could we still try and find you and sign up to use the telescope? If you come to Swansea University, yes, yes, you can. <laughs> um, yeah, what we try and do actually is, um, we try and encourage, it's, it's mainly for schools use, as I say, we do have undergrads using it as well. Um, but we would probably encourage you to do something maybe in the community. Um, so with guides or scouts or a youth club, just so that other people also get the benefits of it. So, for example, there might be some amateur astronomers um, in this webinar. And although some amateur astronomy societies do have access to the telescope, it's because they do stuff with their, their younger members or they, they do things in the community. Um, because the whole point of the Folks Project is trying to get kids interested in, in STEM subjects. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a couple of questions about work experience in astrophysics. Do you have any insight into that? I mean, if you're just actually wanting to get your hands on the telescope, um, as well as the Forks telescope, I guess one, you could always get in touch with, with uh, an, your local astronomy society. And there, there are very good ones in Swansea and in Cardiff and in Bridgend and in Port Talbot. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've had quite a few work experience students, um, both in the office when we were all based together, um, but also we've had sort of um, remote work experience students, um, which probably works a lot better during a pandemic now. Um, so all the, that's the beauty of having a remote control telescope that you control over the internet. It doesn't really matter where you are. Um, and if you've got Zoom or Skype, then we can virtually supervise you. So we do, in the Folks Project, we have supervised work experience students in the past, and we do try and give them pro proper, but real research projects to, to go through. Um, and I've definitely had work experience students whilst I've been in Swansea. Um, I've only been there a few years. Um, how would um, someone apply for that? Would they go through the, the, the Forks website? No, um, they can do. We don't, well, you just basically send us an email and ask if we're willing to take you on. Because um, it's schools, when, when they have their work experience weeks, um, the students tend, or the teachers tend to, to contact us. And to be, to be honest, if we're doing it virtually, um, I won't say that there's we can't have unlimited numbers because we still do need to supervise you but we can have groups of you working together as well um, on stuff and it's it's not just the research stuff some of you might be interested in um, what we would call outreach so some of you might be thinking about going into teaching and you might be looking at some of our resources and thinking well I could do that better or they need an animation or a poster that explains this and I could do that we have work experience students who do that for us as well, who actually produce things that we then put on our resources site, which I should also mention. Um, so we have a site, um, a resources site um, with all the educational resources um, that you could ask for on there, resources.forks-telescope.com um, is the website for that. Um, and in fact, I'll stop sharing Stellarium and I'll start sharing my internet browser again. So this is the, the Forks resources site. The resources aren't on our main website purely because we've just got so many of them. Um, but you can have a look through these. Some of them need updating because some of them, you know, we, we wrote 10 years ago when we had funding for the project and loads of people working for us. Um, but essentially there's, if, if you want information about something or if you want a worksheet for your um, students um, or if you want ideas for projects or things that you can do, you can find it all on our, on our education website here. Mm. 
yeah, students, yeah, to, to register for an account, if you go to the, the Forbes Telescope website, click on register, it won't mention on there that schools are, that students are allowed to have accounts. And that's because I specifically requested this from the rest of the Forbes team fairly recently when I knew we were doing this webinar, because I thought I couldn't really dangle a five million pound telescope in front of you and then say, ha ha, you can't use it. Um, so you fill, fill out with your name, your email address, as I say, use a school email address because we want to make sure that, you know, we've got your school details. Put your school name in there. Um, organization proof. Well, you can put a link to the school on there. Status within, right, so you can put pupil in there. Um, in the bit about how you can hear, how you heard about us um, say about my webinar and in the other comments, you can say, Dr. Sarah Roberts has approved this account. I will get an email. It's, it's only one person. It's not an automated, per, it's not an automated process. And it's one person who works part time who does the accounts. So you will have to bear with her to set, have them set up. Um, but she will probably email me saying, is it okay to set an account up for, for these people? If you only wanted to use the real time, you don't need an account. You just need to, um, the best thing to do is to join the Forks Telescope mailing list, um, which I think is linked to at the bottom of the, the Forks page, and send me an email um, because you don't actually need an account for a real-time session because we send you an observing token um, and then anyone can use it then. But we still have to keep tabs on who's actually using it and what you're using it for. So if you sent me an email saying, I'd like a real-time session, I'm not interested in doing the Q mode, um, which may well be the case um, if, if you're a pupil. If you're a teacher, you probably want both. Um, then just send me an email and we can, we can see what we can do with the real-time sessions. Bearing in mind that there were a couple of hundred people in this webinar, so time might be um, a bit tighter than usual if you, if you all email me um, to ask about that. <laughs> Oh, I've had a, there's a question from a colleague, Pete Lloyd, who works in the uh, School of Education here at Swansea, and he has Ooh. asked me to point out that Swansea is running a, a PGCE for anybody, any, presumably anybody who's interested in a, becoming a qualified teacher. That could be somebody who's just graduating or somebody who's contemplating a, a career move. So, um, if anybody wants to get in touch, uh, I'd be very happy to pass on uh, any inquiries from my email to, to, to Pete Lloyd. And I'll just repeat because there was some there were some late um, comers. This uh, there will be a recording of this webinar available to you. Um, it'll be sent out once it's up online um, by one of my colleagues. Okay, so. Um, that's just to answer some of the questions on here. Um, I think, yeah, we, we, we'll, we'll collect all the questions together and um, find some way of responding to them. I think possibly it would help to produce a little fact sheet with, with basic information on, on perhaps these, these different sites and resources that, that have been yeah. mentioned. Uh, yeah, so I'll so. do that. I'll do, I'll do a very, yeah. A quick, a quick guide to the Forks Telescope project yeah, and how so, to get. So that, that will all be circulated afterwards if you've not if you've not been able to to keep up with writing down all the names of the uh, of the resources. The other thing I should point out: there are some. We have put some links in the chat window on webinar. Um, we've put a, a link to the the Forks Telescope web page, also a link to to our Swansea University Physics web page, uh, with with links to the other webinars that 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 we have uh, run over the past uh, months. Um, and again, if any, yes. And the other, the other thing I, I should just repeat as well, um, if I don't answer all these questions here, um, then I will, we will have a copy of all these questions. So I will go through them one by one and we will mm. circulate those mm. as well. Um, I can see one here 
can you spot asteroids for their own satellites? It's, it, it's one of the images that I took out of my PowerPoint, which is unfortunate. Um, so the image, if you remember, I showed you an image of an asteroid moving across the sky and that a group of schools from the UK and Europe had actually they'd spent a whole day looking at this asteroid and measuring the light and how it changed over time. So you could see it tumbling, as I said, as it reflects different um, amounts of light. The same group also looked at an asteroid, um, I think it was asteroid Kariba, that has its own moon. And they actually using exactly the same process. So, you know, measuring the light from the asteroid, they were able to see when the moon passed in front of the asteroid as well. So you could see a little dip in their data. It, so you've got the light from the asteroid and then there's a dip when the moon's passing in front and then the clouds came in. So there's a gap in the data and then it's up here again. So you can see the asteroid. So there is a bit of a gap there, but it is, it is possible to do that. Um, yes. And the images, how far apart should images be taken when you're, when you're looking at asteroids? In a way, it depends how fast the asteroid is moving. Um, but every, maybe every minute or a couple of minutes or so. So what I used to do when I was imaging an asteroid so that I could blink through the images was I would take an image of the, the field where I thought the asteroid was. Then I would take an image of um, a galaxy it was always a galaxy. And then I would go back after doing that exposure, which would be typically one or two minutes. And then I'd take another image of the asteroid field and take another separate image of a deep sky object and then do a third image of the asteroid field. It feels to me like we're coming to a natural conclusion. Yeah, yeah, because there's a lot of questions on here that I could answer, but you would get a lot more out of it if I gave you links and sort of images and stuff to answer them rather than my hand waving um, in there. Do you want to stop sharing the screen? Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so for those of you who stayed the course and are still here, thank you for coming today. And I'd also like to thank on behalf of everyone, I'd like to thank Sarah for uh, leading us through the wonders of the universe. Thank you.